Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Let me welcome you here to this uh, special service as we come to worship our merciful God and also as we join together later on uh, to celebrate the sacrament of the, the Lord's Supper. Uh, a warm word of welcome to any across the way in the hall. I trust again, again you will feel God's presence with us and those who will listen to this service later on in the week, either by means of CD, DVD ministry or through our YouTube channel. Again, we trust you'll sense a uh, special presence of the Lord on this day. A few announcements. First of all, this evening, our evening services continue at 7 p.m. in the church building. The church will be sanitized and fogged directly after this service to make the church safe uh, and all in compliance with COVID-19 regulations. So that's this evening at 7 p.m. Uh, we return to, to express thanksgiving to God for his great mercy towards us. Then on Tuesday evening at 8 p.m., there will be a meeting of the Kirk Session, and that will be held in the church hall. So that's Tuesday evening, at the 25th of May at 8 p.m. in the church hall Kirk Session meeting. And then on Wednesday evening, again in the church hall, uh, there will be our midweek Bible study and prayer fellowship. That's at 8.30 in the church hall. And again, between Tuesday and Wednesday, the hall will be fogged and sanitized, so it will be completely safe to be able to come to our midweek if you're not there. Uh, you're not a member of, of our session, obviously. Finally, it is with regret that I have, a, have been asked and have to announce the death of the late Mr. Jack Ray, 68 Glenhead Road. Jack died late yesterday evening, and the funeral arrangements have yet to be confirmed, and just contact the local press for details with regards to that. We'll remember his family later on in our service uh, in our prayers. Those are all of our announcements. On Wednesday evening, we were considering Hebrews 9, redemption through the blood of Jesus. And it reminds us of God's great mercy towards sinners and that he allowed his only son, indeed he sent his only son, he commissioned him to shed his precious blood for our redemption. Today, as we continue our theme, our series on, this, on the Beatitudes, we've reached the, this, the fifth Beatitude, and there the, the great big theme is God's overflowing mercy. God's overflowing mercy. In 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 3, we read these words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. And Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We can receive mercy through the blood of Jesus, the man of sorrows who went to the cross of Calvary to purchase our redemption. Let's stand as we worship him with our opening praise. It is number 693 in our hymn book, Man of Sorrows, Wondrous Name, For the Son of God who claimed, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a saviour. What makes us right to come to the Lord's table today? It's only the man of sorrows and his blood that was shed for our redemption. Let's stand and worship him together in song.
Let's pray together. Merciful Father, God of all comfort, we come on this special communion Sunday to praise you, to bless you, to worship you, in and through that wondrous name that we've been singing about our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We bless you as we heard on Wednesday evening that Jesus Christ is our great high priest. We thank you that Jesus Christ is the mediator of a new covenant through the blood that he shed for sinners like us at Calvary. We thank you for the work of the atonement that he completed when Christ came to be the once for all perfect sacrifice for sinners. Eternal God, we thank you for the spotless Lamb of God, the one who came to take away the sins of the world. We bless you, Lord God, in your great mercy. You sent Jesus into this world to die for sinners. We thank you, indeed, he was lifted up to die upon a cross for guilty, for vile, for helpless people such as us who have rebelled against your will and your ways in our life. Lord, we bless you for that. And as we come this morning, we acknowledge and confess that we, just like the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, we continue to struggle with sin. We have that ongoing daily battle, battle with sin in our lives. And, and often, if we're honest and humble enough to admit it, we fall short of your standards. We have sinned grievously against you in thought, word, and deed. And we are no longer worthy to be called your children. But Lord, we thank you that we are made worthy. Not because of anything inherently good within ourselves, but because of the goodness of God. Because of that perfect substitute for sin. Because of that man of sorrows who went to the cross for our redemption. And Father, as we prepare to come to the Lord's table later on in, in this service, we ask indeed that through the blood of Christ you would make us worthy recipients of this means of grace. We pray indeed that you might open our eyes afresh to see your boundless, your limitless, your overflowing mercy to sinners such as us. And Father, we pray even as we listen to what you have to say to us through your word today, that you would help us to show mercy to others. Not to earn favor with you, but because of your mercy, which simply is abundant and overflows through our lives. Father, we do pray especially for the family of the late Jack Ray today whose hearts are really heavy and who need a, a touch from the merciful God of all compassion. We pray for Jack's children, for Elaine, for Nat, for Carl, for Jeffrey. We pray for their spouses. We pray for Jack's grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Lord, that they would know your comfort and your mercy today and especially over the next few days as they prepare for that funeral service. We also want to lift up Anne McConnell and her family circle today on the loss of her brother-in-law, Noel. We pray for Noel's wife. We pray for all within that family that they would know something of your mercy and your grace in these days of time. Father, we leave these people in your care because we indeed know that you are that God of all comfort who can meet people at their point of need when we humble ourselves and seek your face. Hear our prayer, we cry, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, could you turn to Matthew chapter 18? Matthew chapter 18, we're reading verse 21 to verse 35. <clears throat> Matthew 18, verses 31 to 21, sorry, to 35, the parable of the unforgiving servant. Let us hear God's word. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may, com may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed, who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. 
And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience or have mercy with me and I will pay you. He refused and he went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. And yet should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? In anger, his master delivered him up to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you, don't for, if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. Amen. And we trust the Lord will bless these very challenging words to our hearts here today. Before we come to consider this passage, we're going to sing again uh, the words of a piece entitled, Merciful God, O Abounding in Love, Faithful to All Who Draw Near You, Standing to Sing. just pray together. Father, we do thank you for your mercy. And now as we come to open up your word, help us to understand this profound teaching, this challenging revolutionary teaching in Matthew chapter 5. We ask these words in Jesus' name. Amen. The, it was 10.43 a.m., the 8th of November, 1987. It marks a historic moment in the history 
of Northern Ireland. At that exact time and that dates the Remembrance Day bombing, otherwise known as the Inniskillen bombing or the Poppy Day massacre, occurred. People are assembling to pay their respects to others who had sacrificed their lives for their religious freedom. When suddenly an IRA bomb exploded at the cenotaph in Inniskillen town centre, killing 11 innocent people. A 12th victim slipped into a coma and died 13 years later. Mr. Gordon Wilson, a professing Christian, lost his 20-year-old daughter Marie in that horrific attack. But his response was nothing less than miraculous, friends. Mr. Wilson's response was a true demonstration of the overflowing of God's mercy. He said that as a Christian he completely forgave his daughter's killers and he promised he would pray for them every day that God would have mercy on them. I bear them no ill will. I bear no grudge, said Mr. Wilson. It's part of God's greater plan. God is a good God. Surely only a true follower of Jesus could react in such a manner. Today at this communion service we come to remember another murder. Namely the barbaric crucifixion of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And the murder of Jesus Christ friends just like that awful atrocity in Enniskillen. Was carefully planned in advance. But it wasn't planned by evil men. Rather by the God whose mercy overflows to his people. And as you prepare to come to the Lord's table today, you and I, we are reminded of the body that was broken and the blood that was shed to redeem sinners such as you and I to to make us right before a holy God. Because there is no greater demonstration of mercy than at the cross of Calvary. At Calvary, friends, Christ's blood was shed for sinners like you. And that mercy that Mr. Wilson received through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ filled him and overflowed from him and empowered him to have mercy, even on the very people who killed his own daughter. And you know, friends, that mercy that you have received if you're a true child of God, if you're seeking first his kingdom, if you're hunger and thirsting after righteousness, it will fill you and will overflow from you as you grant mercy. To those who have did wrong against you. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ is teaching in the fifth beatitude. When Jesus says blessed are the merciful. For they shall receive mercy. He's teaching us. About God's overflowing mercy that first comes from God the Father to sinners. And then is poured out on needy people. You see, over the past few weeks, we have been looking through this series on the Beatitudes, and we have heard that they are not a map that shows us how to be saved, but rather the Beatitudes are a mirror that reflect the character of those who have already been truly saved. We have noted that the Beatitudes are deliberately connected. They're laid out in a logical sequence. Charles Haddon Spurgeon calls them a ladder of light, each rung leading further upwards. Last Sunday we considered the fourth beatitude. We heard the promise there that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be satisfied or they shall be filled. In the normal course of events, whenever something is filled, is continually filled, then they would, that would overflow to others. And this is the meaning here. This is the picture that Jesus is giving us when he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You see, friends, the person who is filled with righteousness will find that his righteousness overflows to others in what Jesus defines here as mercy. So as we think about coming to the Lord's table later on today, can I ask you, as I ask myself, is there evidence of God's overflowing mercy in your life? Do you have a merciful, a forgiving heart? Are you, as Jesus instructed Peter in the parable of the unforgiving sinner, 
uh, unforgiving servant, willing to forgive those who have hurt you, those who have wronged you, those who have sinned against you. I trust you're willing to do so. If not, again, might I lovingly say there is a question mark over your profession of faith. And there is a question mark whether you're suitably qualified to come to the Lord's table here today. Blessed are the merciful, for they alone shall receive mercy. Four points this morning I want to consider. Firstly, I want to look at the meaning of mercy. Secondly, the motivation of mercy. Thirdly, the results of showing mercy. Sorry, sorry. Thirdly, the means of showing mercy. And fourthly, the results of showing mercy. Firstly, the meaning of mercy. What does it mean? Well, I'm sure you all will agree this is revolutionary teaching. Whenever you read through the whole of the Sermon on the Mount, you will read it is very challenging. The Greek word used there in Matthew 5 and verse 7 is a very strong word. It means it speaks of a compassion for others that will lead to action. You see, the merciful friends will not just have pity or compassion on others, but that pity or that compassion will compel us, will lead us to take practical steps. The Apostle John writes in 1 John 3 and verse 18, Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And in the Bible, we learn here that mercy operates in two main areas. Firstly, the practical, and secondly, the spiritual. You see, biblical bliss mercy seeks to cater for the needs of the whole man, their physical needs, even their mental needs, and perhaps, above all, their spiritual needs. Jesus Christ, of course, is the supreme model of mercy. And we think about him in the Gospels, we know that Jesus showed mercy to the whole man. In the chapter before Matthew chapter 5, where the Sermon on the Mount begins, we read in, in, in verse chapter 4 and verse 23 these words. He, that is Jesus, went through all of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction amongst the people. The twin pillars of Jesus' ministry on earth was preaching and, and healing. Jesus showed mercy to the whole man. But if you read through that and read through other references in the gospel, you will always realize and see that in his earthly ministry, preaching is always mentioned first to show the importance of the eternal dimension of Christ's message. You see, friends, mercy that ignores spiritual needs is not full mercy. Christian mercy includes gospel mercy. And gospel mercy can only be, 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 be given by those who have received it. So therefore, can I ask you, have you received the mercy of God? Have you been humbled over your sin? Have you had experienced that poverty of spirit that Jesus writes about at the beginning of the Beatitudes? And have you knelt humbly at the foot of the cross of Calvary and trusted in his redeeming blood for your redemption? Whenever you do that, then you should begin to show mercy to others. Can I ask you, do you have mercy? Do you have a passion for the lost souls of other people? Jude commands us in Jude 22 and 23, he says this, Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others as you snatch them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hidden even the garments shown by the flesh. Brothers and sisters in Christ, people all around us are dying in their sin. They need to, to receive the mercy of God. We need to go and show them both the, but with our physical acts and with our spiritual acts by sharing the gospel with them. That there's a God who cares for them. There's a God who loves them. Let me ask you, for example, are you merciful to the farmers out there who are currently worrying, currently suffering perhaps from mental anxiety about the future of their farm? Are you merciful to that office worker who has been had to, 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 to work very long hours as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? Are you merciful to that young student who has went to university and sadly has got into bad company and now has become addicted to drugs? 
The Puritan Thomas Watson writes the following. He says, whenever we see others sleeping the sleep of death and the fire of God's wrath ready to burn about their ears and we are silent, is this not to be an accessory to their death? Sinclair Ferguson says that showing mercy to the poor and the needy is a touchstone and a hallmark of true conversion to Christ. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Mercy, biblical mercy, is a compassion that leads to action. It seeks to cater for the whole man. And of course, we show mercy as we follow the example of Jesus Christ, the supreme example of mercy. Secondly, let's consider for a few moments the motivation for mercy. What motivates Christian people to show mercy to others? Now, first of all, let me clear up a misunderstanding about this beatitude. The reason why Christians show mercy to others is not to receive mercy in return. The Christian should never show mercy in the hope that he will receive mercy in return. If we are seeking to receive mercy by our own merits, what are we doing? We're making a mockery of the body of Christ that was broken and the blood of Christ that was shed for our atonement. Mercy, dear friends, cannot, I repeat, cannot be earned, be earned by our acts of mercy. Someone once said that if God's mercy was to be entered on, on our annual income tax returns, it will go down under unearned income. No mercy, friends, from God is a gift from God. It comes at the, at the point of conversion. And what motivates God's people to show mercy to others is this. We have been shown mercy by God. The reason why we show mercy to others is God's overflowing mercy to us should then overflow to others. Very naturally. Mercy, of course, is one of the attributes of God. We read many times in the Old Testament that God is forgiving. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And surely if we profess to be followers of Jesus Christ, we are to reflect something of the image of God in our lives. And part of that should be mercy. We're motivated to show mercy because we've been shown mercy by God. Just think for a moment or two about what God has done for you and what God continues to do for you. Or our merciful God continues to provide for all of our basic needs for life. Acts 17 and verse 24 and 25 says that the God who made the world and everything in it gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Thomas Watson, the great Puritan, says this. Every time you draw in breath, you suck in mercy. But for the Christian, God in his mercy has done even more than providing for all their basic needs. He has provided for our spiritual needs. What has he done? In mercy, he has saved us. He has redeemed us by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, the apostle Paul begins by reminding us that by nature we are all children of wrath. But then in Ephesians 2 and verse 4, Paul writes perhaps two of the most wonderful words in the whole of the Bible. He writes, but God... We were once objects of wrath. Verse 4, but God. And then he goes on to say, being rich in mercy made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace or mercy you've been saved. You see, friends, God's mercy is not passive. God's mercy is active. The word of God teaches us that God cannot stand sin. God must punish sin. But in mercy, God acts. How has he acted? Well, he has acted by sending his son Jesus into this world to die on the cross of Calvary for unworthy sinners like you and me. On the cross, the blood of Christ poured out as that demonstration, visible demonstration of God's overflowing mercy for hell-deserving sinners. And of course, we rejoice if we're Christians here today in that mercy. But because we have received that mercy, because he provides us for all our needs, because he has saved us in mercy, then surely we should show mercy to others. The Apostle John writes in 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. You see how it works? Sometimes perhaps think of those people you find it difficult to love. You'll never love them. 
But, but we love them because he first loved us. His overflowing mercy, his overflowing love works through us and reaches out to those in need. A.W. Pink writes the following. He says, In the Beatitudes, Jesus gives us the birthmarks by which true subjects of the kingdom will be identified. In the Beatitudes, Jesus gives us the birthmarks by which the true subjects of the kingdom may be identified. I wonder, is there birthmarks of true kingdom life in your life, friends? Are you showing mercy to others as Christ has shown mercy to you? The meaning of mercy. The motivation of mercy. Thirdly, let's consider a few practical means through which we might show mercy to others. And certainly the most obvious one is, is it comes from the reading that I read early on in our service, forgiving those who have sinned against us. Whenever Peter came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 18 and said, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother who has wronged me or who has sins against me? The answer he received was, was not only revolutionary, but it was deeply challenging. Jesus says not seven times, but 70 times seven. That means infinity. That means keep on forgiving. You see, as a true child of God reflects upon the mercy that we have received from God the Father, through God the Son, we will forgive those who hurt us. We will not be like that hard-hearted, unforgiving servant in the parable Jesus went on to tell. He was forgiven of, of a huge debt. Years and years of income. He would have had to work out through before he could repay it. He was forgiven it. But then he went out and someone who owed him a few denarii, he did not show mercy to him. No, friends, the true Christian will continually forgive others who sin against them. How can we do that? Whenever we're hungering and thirsting and after righteousness. Whenever we've received mercy and we're filled and that overflows to others. I think it's a very timely lesson as we come today to celebrate of the Lord's Supper. Before we come, pause and ask ourselves, am I showing mercy to those who have sinned against me? Well, that was an awful sin they did against me. But in God's eyes, sin is sin. In God, God's eyes, the followers of Jesus Christ should be willing to show mercy, regardless of the offense. Are you willing to forgive others as Christ has forgiven you? The person who is unwilling to do so is not blessed of God. They're not approved by God. There's a question mark over their profession of faith. John MacArthur in his commentary on this Beatitudes challenges that, that mercy is not only shown in our willingness to forgive those who sin against us, but it is also to be shown in our attitudes towards other people. You see, mercy does not hold grudges against others. Mercy does not harbor resentment against others. Mercy does not recognize or exploit someone else's weakness. No, mercy is shown in our attitude towards others as well as our forgiveness. The early church father, Augustine, warns, whoever thinks that he is able to nibble at the life of absent friends must know that he is unworthy of the table. Whoever thinks he is able to nibble at the life of absent friends must know that he's unworthy of the table. How do we show mercy? We forgive others and we forget. We adopt a Christ-like attitude towards them, even if they keep on offending us, trampling over us. Christian mercy continues to forgive. Of course, mercy is also shown in physical acts. Matthew 25, Jesus, whenever he was teaching about the final judgment, he said that we're to feed the hungry, we're to clothe the naked, we're to visit the sick and the prisoners, we're to give help to those in need. Do we do that? Do you do that? Do you help others in need? Do you give of your time, your talents, maybe even your, your money to help those who are more needy than you in this area and throughout the world? Small acts of mercy, of kindness, are evidence that we have received the mercy of Christ. 
And of course, I return to perhaps what is the most important of all. Mercy is to be shown spiritually. Whenever we have received the mercy of God, what will happen? We will have compassion on others, especially those who are lost. We will be concerned over the lost condition. We will worry about them. And that, that compassion for their souls will lead to action. We will gently and lovingly confront them about their sin and, and, and we will call them to Christ. We will also comfort and confront those who are backslidden with a view to the repentance. The merciful will pray over souls who are, who are lost and souls who have become careless. These are the ways, friends, in which we can show mercy. Forgive people. The way we treat people. Physical acts, good deeds. And perhaps above all, sharing the good news of the gospel. And put Jesus Christ with them. Again, before you come to the Lord's table, ask yourself, as I ask myself, is there evidence of these means in my life? And if there is, fourthly and finally, be encouraged with the results of showing mercy. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall, show, they shall receive mercy. And again, let me remind you that at first glance it may seem here that a person who shows mercy will receive mercy, but that's not what Jesus is teaching here. If that was the case, it would have meant Jesus' blood wouldn't have to be shed for our redemption. No, that's not what Jesus is teaching here. If we think about what we've heard so far in these Beatitudes, to become poor in spirit, to be humbled over our sin is a mercy from God. It delivers us from our own pride. Uh, it is all of God's mercy that we're brought to that point whenever we mourn over our sin, whenever we loathe our sin. It is all of God's mercy that we become meek and we acknowledge that we have no right to, to, to have a favor from God and yet we inherit the, the, the earth. And it's of God's mercy that we're moved to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And it is also of God's mercy that our hard and unforgiving hearts have been made merciful. But, but, but in what ways will we receive mercy? Well, again, with all the promises and the Beatitudes, the answer is, is twofold. There's a temporal one in the here and now, and there's an eternal one. In the here and now, in, in the temporal realm, realm the, 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 the reward here is that there is therapeutic value. There's a genuine happiness in showing mercy to others. Whenever I was a young Christian, I remember being taught uh, that how can you be happy as a Christian? Uh, one way of explaining it is through the little word joy, J-O-Y. Jesus, I was taught, to, or J, I was taught stood for, for Jesus first. O was for others next. And Y then was for yourself last. And it sounds very simple, but it's very true and it's scriptural. You see, there is a joy whenever we seek first Jesus and his kingdom. There is a joy whenever we put others first and then ourselves last. And whenever we forgive others who have harmed us, it, deliver us, it delivers us from that, that awful emotion of anger that eats us up and, and ruins our life. It delivers us from the, the cost of hatred and, and, and the waste of spirits. It delivers us from sin whenever we show mercy to others. So there is a reward for being merciful in the here and now. But this promise, friends, clearly has eternal dimensions. The promise of mercy also has an eternal dimension. In Jude 21, we read these words, where ours, keep yourself in the love of God. Why? Waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. You see, friends, those who have been changed by God's mercy have a great future to look forward to. One day we will discover that even the greatest blessings we have received from the Father of all mercies on their earth will be surpassed when we go to his glorious presence forever. And as we prepare to come to the table in a moment or two, this sacrament of the Lord's Supper, it's a picture of God's overflowing mercy towards us as we remember the body that was broken and the blood that was shed. But this sacrament, friends, is merely a fortieth of the blessings that we will receive in the glory whenever the Christian will be able to share table fellowship with Christ at the wedding supper of the Lamb. That is the ultimate overflowing of God's mercy to his people. Is that something you're looking forward to? 
that one day you'll be in glory and one day you will see Jesus face to face. Not because of anything good you've done, but because you've been the recipient of his overflowing mercy. Friends, if you've received this overflowing mercy that I've been speaking about, then you're to show it to others. And if you've received it and you're showing it, then you're to come and give thanks as we come to the table of the King. Let's pray together. Father, once again, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for Jesus, the Lamb that was slain, the spotless Lamb of God who purchased our redemption at such a huge cost on Calvary. And Lord, we pray that through your word and by your spirit, you would perhaps draw any who have yet not received your mercy to that point of conviction and conversion. Father, draw them to yourself to receive the mercy of God. For those who have, Lord, so fill us with righteousness, so fill us with your mercy, that we might demonstrate evidence of being truly saved as we show mercy to others. Hear our prayer, we cry, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand now to sing our uh, communion hymn. That's become traditionally known as our communion hymn. The first three verses of our hymn, Behold the Lamb of who bears our sins away, slain for us, and we remember. Let's stand as we continue to worship God. Let's just pray. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that we can join together sisters in Christ around the table of the King. We thank you for King Jesus. 
And Father, as we draw together to partake of this sacrament, we thank you for the privilege, and we ask indeed that you would grace us with a special sense of your presence, that you would open our eyes to see afresh the overflowing mercy that you have for sinners such as us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All who know and love Jesus as their personal Savior and Lord and are in good standing with your neighbor are invited to come and share with us today around the table of the king. It's going to be slightly different than usual. Hopefully by now you all will have had one of these wee packs. If not, raise your hand and Andrew will try and, and come to you. Uh, there's one. Could you maybe, Aaron, go in and get one for it? That would be great. Thanks. Just by way of practicality, no communion tokens will be received today in keeping with the advice given from assembly buildings with regards to administration of the sacraments during the COVID-19 pandemic. But as we prepare to come to the table, let us first listen to the words of institution to the sacrament as spoken by Jesus and given to the, given to the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let us hear God's word. For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup and after supper saying, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Those are the words of the merciful invitation of Jesus to come to the table to remember him, the Lamb of God who was slain to redeem sinners such as us from the power and the penalty of our sin. And if we come with truly penitent hearts and with a living faith, then the benefit is immeasurable. Through the means of grace, we can receive comfort and strength. We can be renewed in our souls as we eat these symbols, reminding us of Christ's redemption his work for us at Calvary. But in that invitation, there is also a word of, of warning. We're encouraged to examine ourselves before we come, because to receive this sacrament unworthily is to sin, the Bible says, against the very body and blood of Jesus. To come to the table unworthily is to bring ourselves under the judgment of a holy God. And of course, we are only made fit to come not through anything in ourselves, but through trusting in the blood of Jesus that redeems us and having received that merciful gift of redemption. So therefore, before we come, ask yourself, have I as yet been redeemed? Have I received the mercy of God? Am I a true child of God? Only such people are spiritually qualified to come. And if you are a true child of God, then also ask yourself, is there any uh, lingering sin, unconfessed sin within my heart that I need to confess before God before I come. That lack of mercy, perhaps. That unwillingness to forgive. Those sins of omission, as well as the sins of commission, we need to, to repent of them and seek God's mercy. Let's just do that now as we come to pray. Let's pray together. I want to read, first of all, a few words that David cried out after he had sinned grievously. Psalm 51, he said, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, creating me a pure heart, O God and renew a right spirit within me. We pause at this moment to confess those sins 
that still separate us in a sense from God, asking that he will cleanse us, that he will, in his mercy, bring us into that right relationship with himself through Jesus. The word of God reminds us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Father God, we thank you that you are a God of mercy, a God of faithfulness. We thank you indeed that because of Christ's death and resurrection, we now can have hope of resurrection glory one day to be with you. We thank you that all our sins, past, present, and future are covered through the blood of Jesus. And so at your invitation, at your command, we come and we present ourselves at this table to remember your death and your resurrection. And as we come, we declare and we witness to others that we are trusting in the redeeming blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, and we have received your mercy. We bless you for this. We thank you for this from the very core of our being. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The night on which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, take it, this is my body broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This morning, I see some people have already begun, folks, but you all should have a, a little uh, sashi here in, in front of you. What we're going to do is, we're go- if you open, notice if you open the top bit, you will receive the bread, and then whenever you op- the, open the next section, you will see, receive the wine. You can do that now. Just open them up now, and then whenever I uh, give the word, uh, we can come and we can eat and drink together all at the same time. So, in preparation, if you take your disposal communion packages in your pew and just open up and be careful just that we don't uh, maybe spill something over our clothes or dresses or something. It's very easy to do so. Strange times calls for strange measures. I'm going to tell you to do that in a second. Whenever everyone feels they are ready and you have it, your, your, your little sashes ready, you can please feel free to remove your facial coverings for this part of the service. Everybody ready? Don't want to rush anybody? We're all going to eat together as an act of of unity here together. So first of all, with your bread, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we eat together. And then if you take your, your cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Do this in remembrance of me. And we drink together. Let's pray. God of all mercy, once again, we thank you for the privilege it is to gather around your table as one body, united in Christ, to be able to just partake of these elements. And Lord, we recognize that due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we've had to do things differently. But Lord, that the meaning and the significance 
is not reduced because of that. And now we pray that as we leave this place of worship, after encountering you afresh, the one true living God, we ask that you would grant us the grace and the mercy that we need to be worthy ambassadors of the gospel. We pray, O oh God, that that overflowing mercy that was poured out on the cross of Calvary would so fill us afresh today that we would go out into the world throughout this week and we would share your love and your mercy and your compassion to all that we meet. And Lord, as we rise from the table, may our hearts be filled with hope and joy and the anticipation that one day Christ will return to restore all things and then we'll experience that perfect mercy, that perfect communion, with him and all the saints, the redeemed in glory, forever and ever. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We stand to sing our closing praise, which is verse, verse 4 of our communion hymn. And so with thankfulness and faith we rise to respond. And remember our call to follow in the steps of Christ as his body here on earth. We are the ones now who can show mercy. And we're the ones who are called to follow his example. Let's stand as we bring our time to a close with this piece. We conclude our service with a few words towards the end of the book of Jude. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hitting even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen.